Yes. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, this is the May 4th um, meeting of the Science and Data Subcommittee of the Vermont Climate Council. Um, my name is Jared Duval, um, co-chair. I just posted in the chat, <clears throat> which is also available online on the climatechange.gov uh, uh, website for Vermont, the agenda for our meeting this afternoon. Um, we are, uh, so the first thing I just want to do is welcome um, everybody. Thank you for attending. Would invite, I know that there's a number of um, kind of agency staff who often join in and uh, engage in and support these meetings. And I think sometimes it's easier for that to happen when your cameras are on. So would invite those of you, I think I see Colin and Ken Jones to um, go ahead and turn your videos on and, and um, other subcommittee members as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do a very quick um, overview of the agenda and then um, we'll uh, look at and approve the minutes and then I'll turn it over to Megan. But to start with the agenda, we're gonna um, uh, consider and uh, look for approval of our minutes from our last subcommittee meeting. Um, then Megan is gonna lead off a conversation to review the, the life cycle analysis request for proposals or RFP draft. And then we're gonna pause there for brief public comment um, in case people have to leave early or that people wanna, um, focus specifically comments on, on that RFP. Um, and then we are going to um, share uh, an update from the, the task group that was formed to review all of the nominations that came in for new subcommittee members. Um, that was myself, Megan, um, Dr. Uh, Dupini Giroux and Claire McElvenny. The four of us met a couple of times to review those and have a consensus recommended slate to put forward for consideration. Um, and then we'll have time for other updates, <clears throat> including from um, other subcommittee liaisons and, and other kind of updates related to the work of the subcommittee and the council. Um, and then we'll do public comment and then we'll talk about um, our next meetings and looking ahead to the, to the summer. Um, but so with that, unless there are any questions um, about the agenda, um, I would um, ask if there are any, um, any concerns with um, approving um, the minutes of the last subcommittee meeting? Um, I did notice one small typo uh, that I just caught looking at it before the meeting. I think there's a place where it says decision rather than discussion. Um, but other than that, I thought they looked good. Anybody else has does anybody else have anything on the minutes before we consider them? Approved. It looked good to me. Thanks, Claire. Anybody else? Okay, so hearing, hearing um, no other, um, nothing else on that. Let's consider those minutes approved, and um, we can move to our first or our next agenda item on the life cycle analysis RFP. Over to you, Megan. Thanks, Jared. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see you all today. Um, so uh, hoping to spend some time today reviewing a draft of a request for proposals for um, a life cycle analysis. So just to refresh everyone's recollections, um, previously we have uh, reviewed and issued a request for information regarding a life cycle emissions project, our emissions analysis project. And um, this is our, our next step in the process of actually um, securing a, a contractor to do this, this complicated work. And uh, we had reviewed uh, among the subcommittee the responses to requests for information. And then following that review, um, DEC staff, including myself, um, Colin, who's on the line, Brian Woods, and Jeff Merrill uh, drafted an RFP based on the information we'd, we'd gathered in that process. And then the um, life cycle analysis task group 
reviewed that draft and provided feedback. And so the version that is shared with you all today is the version that was um, marked up by that task group. Um, so that's what the track changes reflect in the version that you were um, uh, that was sent with the agenda. So I'm just going to um, share my screen, I think, is the best way to go through the draft. And I want to apologize because, um, Claire, I have not had a chance to take a look at the comments that you sent earlier today as of yet. Um, so as we're going through, please feel free to highlight um, areas where you had comments. Um, but I, my apologies, I didn't get a chance to incorporate those yet. No, that's um, OK. And I just figured I'd send them to the task group so the non-science and data folks have them as well. Yeah, I'll just okay. flag them as we go. Great. Um, so the this looks like a lot like other RFPs that you all might be familiar with that are issued by the state um, so th that we start off with some some general language about the specifications related to the project but um, we get into a lot more detail later on in the scope of services that's really where the meat of the um, request is so um, this is just generally laying out the scope of the project. I think this first paragraph does a really good job at um, letting um, potential applicants understand what our comprehensive scope is for a life cycle analysis for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then this is um, just, you know, kind of the standard contracting and, and bid process that we go through at ANR. Um, contact information for Jane, who will be the lead in answering questions and um, dealing with the administrative matters related to the RFP, uh, the, the scheduling regarding deadline for questions and submission of RFP responses. And then we hope to select a contractor to do this work over the summer. Um, so that's the timeline that we're hoping for if we can get this RFP out pretty quickly. We have introduction and background related to the context of the Global Warming Solutions Act and the fact that the um, Climate Council included um, a recommendation for this work to be done in the initial climate action plan. So that's all here. Um, also some context setting with the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which is our current um, greenhouse gas emissions inventory for in-boundary um, gross emissions. Um, so, sorry, I'm just seeing, just looking at the chat. Um, okay, so Jared, you have the link. Thank you for putting the link to the RFP. So Leslie, and you could, that link should take you to the draft RFP that Jared had put in the chat earlier. Um, OK. And then some edits that um, the task group made um, is related to um, language changes that are consistent with the Global Warming Solutions Act. For example, the Global Warming Solutions Act refers to energy use, um, use of energy in Vermont. Um, that's in, in Section 578 of the GWSA in Title 10. Um, and just to be clear, um, and, and removing the reference to energy supply. So that's just a distinction between use and supply. Um, the work of the, um, uh, the, the project that the contractor will engage in um, will be closely tied to review and um, kind of vetting and, and responses uh, by the, the, the task group and then this subcommittee so there'll be many opportunities for um, the work to kind of come back to this group for review and comment. Any questions so far? All right. Um, scope of services, as I said, is where um, the most detail is for the proposal. Um, this again is reiterating the scope of the work that we're hoping to have done. 
Um, the analysis we propose to be composed of three elements. One is the identification of life cycle components of the state's energy sources um, as listed above in the scope. Number two is a determination of a life cycle emissions factor for each of those energy sources. And then finally, the determination of the mass and CO2 equivalent of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from each energy source in the list related to um, end use in Vermont. Maybe, so sorry, just quickly before yeah. we go too far, I did notice just a tiny typo that I put mm -hmm. in the chat um, yeah. from where we changed the supply to the use of energy. It, you can just we can also delete the um, apostrophe s. Um, uh, it was further up, I think. Yeah, up there. Got it. Thank you. Make sure I caught that above too. All right. Great. Thank you. OK, um, so all of this will be um, compiled into a detailed methodology report that the contractor will provide to us for for review. Um, and the um, the table that's provided in as an example is just kind of a vision for you know how how we want um, the information in the methodology to be displayed regarding you know the specific sector, the sources that are in each sector, um, the inventory emissions from our gross in boundary emissions inventory, and then the life cycle emissions associated with each of those sources. So that is. Um, the kind of just a, again, just an example to give the contractor some guidance on how we want that information to be laid out in their proposal. Um, and Claire, I think you had a comment on this table. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yes, I it was on the comment about um, of engaging with the contractor on accounting for recs, which I yeah. was I, that was what I was going to suggest in yesterday's meeting. But I think we probably want it to be not just accounting specifically of RECs, but all attributes associated with generation since um, the, de I mean, just at a high level, every megawatt hour that is tracked in the NEPL GIS system has an, a certificate or an attribute, whether or not it's renewable um, qualified. So we, I just think we probably want it to be that broad scope because that would include things like nu nuclear attributes, um, which wouldn't be qualified as renewable, but be carbon free and and other generators like that. Um, okay, that's a great really, point and a good catch there. Yeah, that's really helpful, Claire. So, do you think that that is something that we should articulate in the proposal, or something that we should um, kind of save for discussion and engagement with the contractor when we have them on board? How how would you? Yeah, that? I don't think it necessarily needs to be in the proposal. I don't think we reference it anywhere else in the text, yeah. but I just wanted to flag it so that we would have have it top of mind when bring someone on board. OK, great. Um, I appreciate that um, input and, and yeah, so I think we should we should that's something that unless anyone thinks that there is value in um, including that um, information as background or I mean I don't know maybe we can think about it but if not we'll save it for future discussion and, and collaboration with the contractor okay um so our next part of the scope of services section is the specific tasks that we're going to um ask the contractor to perform um and first, and this is something um, that uh, Jane very helpfully added in, into this document, um, since she's so keenly aware of all the other contracts that she's been managing in this realm. Um, but it's just a helpful kind of setting the stage for how the project will be managed um, and the different um, parties that will be involved in, in review and oversight of the project. And so just kind of setting the stage initially um, in the in in the beginning of the project in terms of how things will flow and how things will be managed and communicated. So there'll be some kickoff meetings and um, a uh, development work plan, um, and then there'll be ongoing project management and meetings that will happen throughout the course of the contract. 
And then the second stage will be a um, review of existing materials um, to help inform the development of the methodology. Um, and this is um, where we kind of add, add some detail in terms of background that we would want the contractor to consider and provide some example pathways that would be evaluated from a life cycle perspective. Um, so we, we have a, a pretty good list here of pathways um, Claire, you had added um, the biomass to electricity pathway, which I did add in here. Um, so thank you for, for pointing that out. I think we just omitted that accidentally. Um, but if anyone has had a chance to review this list and has any other ideas for pathways that we'd want to include as, a, as examples here, um, please chime in. Claire. Um, I didn't include this in my comments, but I thought of it afterwards on the hydroelectric. I know we, and again, I don't know if this necessarily needs to make it into the RFP, but they specify sort of in-state, out-of-state, or in-state domestic um, and out of, and imported. And I also wonder if there's value in looking at it by size of hydroelectric plant, which is somewhat implicit in sort of where it are, where the where the hydro is just based on what's been developed and where, but it's not necessarily the same, like aligned that way always. So I don't know, I just wanted to raise that as a question. I don't necessarily have the answer. <laughs> um, okay, but. so would you, how would you classify the different sizes of um, hydroelectric generation? Yeah, I can, I don't know it off the top of my head how it's classified in various statutes. It's sort of also related to our, the task group conversation about our definition of renewable um, and how hydro is or isn't included in that in various jurisdictions. So I could look at the sizes that are typically given um, and potentially work with others at the, the department who are a little more knowledgeable, but we'd consider small versus be mid-size and large, but. Okay, um, I, I feel like this is, and and can you, I see your um, addition in the chat of um, dis, uh, differentiating hydro by mm -hmm. reservoir versus in stream rather than a particular size of the source. Um, so I'm wondering if this is detail that we could kind of again reserve for um, like further work with the contractor when we're talking about development of the methodology um, unless you feel it's helpful to have this detail in the RFP itself. No, not necessarily just another sort of yeah. figured I'd flag it, flag it. Okay. Well, it came to mind. All right. Any other pathways that are missing or need to be elaborated on? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. Um, so this is more detail about um, how life cycle emissions factors specifically will be discussed. Um, uh, we, we, the task group had some discussion of um, how um, the factors, like what unit the, the factors would be in, um, depending on the, the source and pathway. Um, and kind of agreed that there would be some value in, in normalizing the units at some point. And so um, recommended that um, the, the factors should be normalized to MMBTU units. And so included that detail here. Great. All right, I see the thumbs up from Richard. That's good, all right. <laughs> um, so again, um, deliverables for this task will be some meetings as we develop the um, the methodology or as we review the development of the methodology from the contractor. Um, and then uh, we'll be able to review the methodology report that will be developed um, as well. And then the final task, which um, is kind of a, um, you know, nice if we can get it kind of thing. Um, I think it really depends on the the proposals that we receive and um, how those mesh with our our budget constraints. But 
it would be great to have this same contractor engage in implementation of the methodology that they recommend to the state. And so we're including that as the final task and deliverable here. So it would be our um, our first ever um, life cycle emissions inventory for the state of Vermont um, that the contractor would produce. And I just wanted to remind folks um, so that and especially so I don't get any dirty looks from from Colin. This is a supplemental um, analysis that will live um, kind of parallel to our greenhouse gas emission in boundary gross emissions inventory. Um, we're not converting our current inventory to a life cycle inventory. We're um, developing another inventory so that we can um, uh, use it to inform future decision making. Julie. Do we feel like we have resources to do that with with what's available currently within our budget? To continue doing it annually or to ask the contractor to do the first one? Both. Um, so to to ask the contractor, we we added this in here um, to see what the um, you know um, proposals would look like in in terms of how they would mesh with our our budget. Um, and the funding that we have available for, for this work. And I think we decided that if they were coming in over budget, we would probably, the first thing we would negotiate off would be this task three implementation item. Yep. Um, in terms of continuing implementation of the methodology, um, we've talked a lot about that internally within DEC, and I think that's still very much an open question in terms of staff resources and, you know, and, and other resources to do the work. Um, but uh, I think there would be the one of the goals of um, uh, developing, working closely with the contractor to develop the methodology would be to understand whether or not this is something that ANR staff would be able to implement um, on an annual basis, uh, or if it would be, um, not that straightforward, I guess. <laughs> so sure. that I think that's still an open question. I, I hope that's helpful. But yeah, I just the, my my gut reaction is that contractors usually do their homework and will look to see how much money we've allocated and to the extent this feels like it goes will go well outside of budget, they may be more reluctant to bid. Um, okay. And so we just need to be thoughtful about not putting out a scope that we believe is unattainable um, with the resources we have available. Okay. Yeah, I think we could have some more discussion maybe wow. among, I know, you know, uh, Brian and Jeff have, have both worked with contractors to do actual life cycle analyses before, and obviously Colin has a lot of knowledge about what it requ what is required to, to um, Put together an inventory so maybe we can talk internally and see um yeah. you know just kind of what our ballpark um idea would be about what how how much this might push us over budget correct or even just add it as an optional task but i yeah i agree megan i think we can discuss this more internally i just want to make sure that that the first two tasks sort of get we we get as many bidders as possible and and ideas and approaches for those first two tasks Okay, and I, I'm sorry, I see Jay and Richard. But I'm not sure who had their hand up first. Um, I don't know if Richard, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I think I'm going to say something that probably most of you know well, but just to comment that a, a project like this, a document like this, a, a complicated analysis, doing it the first time is the hardest. Doing it the second time, I trust, and the third time is usually much easier. By the time you get to the fifth time, the data sources will have changed and your needs will have changed. And so it starts to become more difficult. Mm -hmm. But over typically over a period of two or three, two or three or four iterations, it just gets easier and easier and simpler and simpler to do. Yeah, we, we talked about that, Richard, in terms of, you know, how often would we need to potentially re-engage with a contractor to update the methodology? Um, and that was I think still kind of an open question, um, but I, I agree with everything you just said. Jay? Yeah, and I, I hope I'm not going to blow anything up here, but just on a very high level concept, 
the, the concept of life cycle emissions factor, I think is pretty well defined on this in terms of um, the units and whatnot. The, but the goalposts around life cycle and time scales are still pretty vague to me, and, I, and it's probably intentional by design. But and, and this is partly my own ignorance here. I don't know if there's any more we can do to define like what is a life lifetime analysis. Is this like a yearly uh, snapshot? Is this supposed to be life cycle truly and wholly do this? Because there's a lot of ways to think about this. And maybe if someone who might have a little more knowledge could talk through that, it would just help me understand that. I'm happy to offer one thing that we talked about yesterday, which is the importance of defining life cycle at the beginning of the process. And there is language later in this RFP that talks about establishing the boundaries for life cycle emissions. When we put out the RFI, the response we asked that question in terms of how to define life cycle versus upstream and how the different respondents would approach bounding the analysis. And there were as many responses uh, or, or as many different ideas as there were respondents to how to do that. So very much agree with you, Jay, that, that that's an important thing. That I, I, we felt um, <clears throat> at least the task group that met to review this, that we're not at a point now to say what that definition is here in the RFP, but that that would have to be one of the very first tasks um, of the consultant in coordination with um, ANR um, and the life cycle analysis group in this subcommittee um, to, to set consistent and clear definitions around those those boundaries. Okay, thanks. That makes me feel better that that's an important part of the work and we don't have to put it here if we don't know what we don't know either. Yep. All right. Um, moving on to performance measures, these are mostly a reflection of, of the tasks and add some um, time frame and just kind of more succinct description of the deliverables that were described above. So it shouldn't be any new information here. Um, the pr proposal format that we are looking for is um, also somewhat standard in terms of how responses to RFPs go. Um, obviously, the approach to completing the work is going to be a really critical component, um, and we have some specific items here in terms of, you know, identification of the tools and database, um, the tools and databases that the contractor would plan to use. Um, and then, you know, for each type of, of energy or for each energy type, um, describe what this proposed system boundary would be um, based on the tools and data that they propose to use. Um, and then uh, just, you know, some other items related to um, approaches to um, biomass information, um, any additional analysis that would be required. Um, a comment that we received in our task group review yesterday um, relating to the consideration of um, how traditional ecological knowledge might be applicable to a life cycle emissions analysis. Um, and this is something that we wanted to flag specifically for further discussion within this subcommittee um, because I think it's it's definitely an important item to ask the um, the uh, bidders to consider. Um, also, we would need to consider how we would answer any questions that we received about this particular um, this particular item um, and how we would define traditional ecological knowledge um, within the scope of this work and how it would relate to a greenhouse gas emissions um, inventory or life cycle greenhouse gas emissions inventory specifically um, and the pathways that we're proposing. So um, really interested to hear folks thoughts about this particular item because I think we just want to really make sure that we're able to answer questions appropriately um, and accurately when we get them from bidders if we do. Leslie Ann. Thanks, Megan. 
Um, I think it's a critically important piece to be included. And I just wanted to um, flag that I was on a, a White House call about traditional knowledge about uh, three weeks ago. And a number of the indigenous peoples who were on the call made the specific point that it's traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge because there's no such thing in, in, in their realm of traditional ecological knowledge. So I think in, in this space, reaching out to the members of our subcommittees and our council who have um, either deep expertise or who are members of indigenous peoples would be one way to, to make sure that we are being as inclusive as possible. Okay, thank you, Leslie. And that's really helpful. I um, this particular feedback was received by Judy Dow, who is a new member of our life cycle emissions task group and who comes to us from the um, the just transitions uh, subcommittee. So um, I that this was the language that she had relayed to us during our to our, our meeting. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, I just wanted to, to explain that that was the source. Well, as long as Judy, if Judy has already signed off on it, then I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah, I don't know that I'd say it was a sign off, but it was just that was what she offered in the discussion. So that, yeah. Julie? I, I guess I would suggest that we should be discussing how um, consideration of traditional ecological knowledge might be applied in the to the determination of life cycle factors. I think a discussion of whether is um, going to put people in a really difficult spot to to speak to that. Um, and we want to. I would suspect it would be it would serve us all well to make it more of an affirmative assumption. It should be, and then ask. Um, ask the, the bidders to sort of operationalize it from their perspective. Yeah, I, I, I hear that, Julie, and I think when we added this language in yesterday, um, that was a, a really um, big consideration for the team and trying to um, not make any assumptions about its application to the scope, but just to kind of leave it more open and allow the contractor to discuss their potential ideas for application, if any. Um, so, but I'm definitely open to other ways to articulate this ask um, that might be more appropriate or open. Uh, Brian, I think you have your hand up. I, I do, just to, to try and expand on the question a little bit more. Um, yeah, we incorporated this from, from Judy and, and are happy to, but as, as Megan said, yeah, as we engage contractors before they submit their bids, it's, it's kind of difficult. To, it would be difficult for me to be able to answer a question about in the context of a life cycle greenhouse gas emissions inventory or analysis, what what are you looking for regarding traditional ecological knowledge? And we didn't unfortunately have time to um, get into an extended discussion um, after Judy ex um, proposed, proposed this as a, another activity, and I would welcome that at some point, um, but it, it's just, at least, you know, my understanding of the of the process is, you know, it's, you know, we talked to Jay mentioned it. It's it's pretty straightforward. The complexity comes into how much detail you go into each of the system processes and identifying the boundaries for particular activities regarding greenhouse gas emissions. I can picture an analysis that um, encompasses traditional ecological ecological knowledge or um, you know, health impacts or benefits if your endpoint is to try and determine, you know, so what are the life cycle health impacts or benefits or what are the ecological impacts or benefits of, um, you know, this particular fuel use. But this scope is specific to greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's 
what we're really trying to clarify before we um, issue this, that we understand exactly what we are asking the contractor to, to do or consider beyond the analysis that I think we described pretty well in the rest of the document. Thanks, Brian. So, Jared, I added your edit. Um, I think that's helpful. Any other discussion or feedback on this language? I'm going to drop in a, a link to a well. Maybe I'll drop back up to the the actual do, uh, website of that was shared at a EPA advisory committee I participated. Um, that in, involves a, a a number of different representatives of of different um, Native American populations that they pointed to as a place for integrating traditional knowledge and climate change work that may be helpful in thinking about this a little bit more. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, the, the folks in the, the advisory committee I participate on are largely from the Southwest, and so I, I don't know enough to know if this is sort of biased towards that part of the country and if that's going to have an influence. In particular, it may mean that it doesn't think about uh, hydropower, uh, for example, but it, it may have good good resources for us to consider. All right, anything else on that topic before we keep moving on? OK, um, so other items that we're asking to be included in the proposal are um, the experience of the contractor in, um, you know, generally development of climate action or climate change related work, um, their capacity as a contractor to accomplish the work, their cost proposal, and then the standard certificate of compliance items um, that we require. Um, selection criteria, we tweaked this a little bit yesterday um, when the task group was reviewing to give more weight to um, the experience of, of the contractor. And so then took away some points from the approach to completing the work and the qualifications of the project team. And then also incorporated um, a few other edits here, um, I think, to um, allow for experience for any kind of subnational level inventory development to be counted. And I think that is kind of the end of the exciting parts. Um, yeah, these are all the boring parts. <laughs> so um, happy to have any other discussion or jump to other sections where folks wanted to, uh, to comment but didn't get a chance. So feel free to chime in. Um, hearing no one. Uh, oh, Claire, go ahead. Sorry, I, you have my edit, so this is in the document I sent, but just for the sake of being complete, I, I think it was under task two. Okay. Um, you referenced um, the department's annual energy report, and it was for the 2021. So I just, I think it'd be better to cite the comprehensive energy plan, which was our annual energy report this past year. It has the updated um, CEP goals and um, the most recent data. It's a longer document, but a little more up to date. Okay, so you're saying the CEP was mm -hmm. in fact the annual energy report. It was so just reference the most the the most recent CEP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll do that and, and add a new site as well. <clears throat> Okay. Megan, if I could just offer one other comment um, mm -hmm. towards the end on the piece that you just referenced on changing state to subnational. Mm -hmm. um, I understand and agree with that change to the extent that, you know, if we just said state, there, there may not be many <laughs> bidders who have actually done life cycle analyses at a state level. I know some mm -hmm. are doing it, but it's still relatively new and limited compared to those who are doing more traditional in boundary and 
kind of uh, analyses. Um, how, <clears throat> however, I will say that I would have a preference um, for someone who's worked at a, at a state level, because I know that when we, from what I've seen looking at kind of city data and municipal data is often they're using a different type of methodology and protocol with like the GHG protocol and scope one and scope two and scope three emissions. And there's a, there's a whole approach for doing this type of work for municipalities and cities that some of which may be relevant or the vast majority of which may be relevant, but I've often seen discrepancies um, about the way that kind of a city or a municipality approaches this work than the way kind of a, a state or a provincial or kind of uh, that uh, level of tracking and reporting would, would do it. So I wonder if, I don't want to be too nitpicky here, but um, maybe it's experience supporting development of, of climate action work at a sub-national level with a preference for state level work, um, including. Okay, um, this was Richard's edit and I see he has his hand up. So go ahead, Richard. I like I like what Jared suggests. Okay. So Jared, you said with preference for state level. Yeah. But you know, I was coming from the posture of somebody who has done two local inventories myself, and I didn't want I wouldn't want to be for, for people like me to be totally excluded. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Okay. All right. Any other comments on the document? So I think the the one kind of the piece of feedback that I think is going to require um, maybe sp specifically DEC and ANR folks um, to to go back a bit and have some discussions about the actual implementation task and. Um, whether or not that's realistic within the the budget that we have and and discuss that a little bit further. So we can can certainly do that. Um, I guess I would ask in in terms of next steps, um, you know if if the what what kind of check back does this group want, if any, with the final or um, I know with the RFI after it was reviewed among this group, there was kind mm -hmm. of, deference to the um, the task group and, and state staff to kind of go forward um, with the, you know, um, release of the RFP based on the, an understanding that nothing would drastically change um, over what was discussed. So, Jared, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, that, that would be what you just outlined would be my inclination and preference, but I, before we make that decision, I think it would be good just to open it up for public comment to make sure that. Um, yes. Thank so maybe you. We can, can we come back to that, that question just after we do that? Absolutely. Unless there's any other comments first from subcommittee members or supporting agency staff. Okay, hearing, hearing none, are there any um, members of the public who would like to um, make comments or raise questions about this draft? See George. George, please go ahead. Afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there were two topics I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, the first is in regards to the system boundary. As currently written, the RP allows the contractor candidate. And the risk with doing that is, is that they might narrow the scope of the system boundary to fit inside the available, uh, whatever ceiling they might have in mind for the bid. In other words, instead of getting the full scope of actual emissions, you'll get what the contractor is willing to do for the amount of money he thinks or she can get uh, in the bid process uh, for this work. Uh, so, one possible way to modify the RFP might be to further characterize the system boundary as far as what your group's are, expectations are. 
uh, such that it does not emit things that would be essential. Uh, that's especially important in the biofuels area where the system boundary needs to be done broadly uh, to be accurate. Uh, specifically land use change and indirect land use change could be possible components that could get emitted if you wanted to go less expensively, but they would uh, impact the emissions rate uh, on a substantial basis. Um, second <coughs> comment I had was in regards to the carbon dioxide equivalent that is uh, one of the products that the contractor is supposed to uh, develop. Uh, in the recent assessment report six that was published by the IPCC, uh, they had a chapter on um, greenhouse gas metrics that is looking very extensively at this point at alternatives to carbon dioxide equivalent as it's currently normally used in regulatory and jurisdictional contexts. These alternatives are uh, being developed uh, because there's growing recognition in that community that the um, policies one develops using simply a uh, global warming potential of 100 years can mischaracterize the magnitude of the uh, impacts of a given policy or choices made by a jurisdiction and lead to poor outcomes and potentially missing the Paris Agreement's uh, objectives. Uh, so there's at least four or five different alternative metrics in consideration and developed there in that chapter. And um, I would recommend allowing, for lack of a word, I'll call it hooks in the language of the RFP to allow for a parallel or alternate metric that uh, will emerge over the next year or two that I think um, this issue has been building uh, momentum and uh, needs to be anticipated by this document so you don't entrench a particular way of doing things that's going to uh, require you to zigzag in a different direction later. Thank you. So George, would it, um, I, um, regarding your second point about CO2 equivalent, um, do you think that it would be helpful to maybe put a footnote where we do reference CO2E in the section of the document that I have up right now um, that um, invites the contractor to suggest a different metric? Or an additional metric. Uh, or an additional. Want, I think we want CO2E for sure, but we may, yeah. I think George makes a good point that we may want additional ones as well. Yeah, one way to finesse this would be to you already do require the greenhouse gas emissions in the raw form. In other words, you have the raw amount of emissions factor for methane and then nitrous oxide and any other of the greenhouse gases. Any of the alternative metrics we're talking about use those as input parameters to their calculations. Um, in New York, for example, I believe they checked, uh, decided to do what is a two-pronged um, metric where one is for the short-term uh, climate force and gases like methane and the, the second metric or second number in this uh, would be uh, the long-lived uh, gases such as nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. So um, some, I guess that's one way to do it is, is to add uh, a placeholder for an alternate metric that um, tries to um, and have the contractor nominate which one they recommend for that role. Uh, there's at least four or five proposals I'm aware of that uh, are being addressed as uh, possible candidates for this role. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Colin, do you want to directly follow up on that? Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I just had a quick question, George. So. Uh, I'm not totally familiar with the other metrics that you're talking about yet. Are are they different than carbon dioxide equivalent, or are they still carbon dioxide equivalent, but taking into account kind of the different year thresholds, like the GWP 20 versus 100? Um, so there's two schools of thought here. Um, there's actually a good tutorial I could send to you that I think uh, exposes the motivation for doing all this um, in that, but in essence, uh, 
when you conflate the short-lived climate forcing gases such as methane in one number with long-lived ones, uh, it actually removes some essential uh, climate information that you would need for, for sound policy development. And so these different algorithms, uh, some of them do conflate it into one um, number, but the way they treat global warming potential is far, a little more complicated. And, and, and I think once you've had a review of the literature, uh, to see these different alternatives, you'll understand how each approach has merits and each approach has obviously some uh, drawbacks. Everyone prefers a single number, uh, but actually the best way to express the economy of these short-lived versus long-lived climate forcing gases is to actually have two numbers. Um, <laughs> obviously, it does make uh, people in the regulatory world very happy because obviously they're expecting to have one number that represents every you know, the, the total. And um, I, I don't know how to reconcile that. That's part one of the reasons why uh, they didn't come to a conclusion, I think, in time for this report they just published. Gotcha. If you don't mind sending that, that would be great. Um, I guess my other question there is if it could be somehow incorporated like in the actual deliverable where that kind of value is just a changeable variable so we could plug in what we felt was appropriate and it would update the calculations is that kind of along the lines of what you're thinking in terms of the flexibility of this or well imagine you have actually you actually have what amount to two formulas in this case, right? One formula, the incumbent one, uses a global warming potential of 100 for both methane and carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. whereas these new formulas might uh, be more complex. Still take the emission masses for methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxides as their inputs, among other things. Yeah. But uh, the result, obviously, is going to be a different number than you might have had previously. And right. some of these formulas produce one number, and some of them produce two numbers. Okay. All right. Well, that's interesting. Thanks, and yeah, appreciate that that insight. Thanks, George. Thanks, Mark. I'll send your email address. Sure, I'll I'll send you it to you offline. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I think um, uh, Ken was next on the speakers list and then Steve after Ken. Yeah, my question, and I don't have the familiarity with this as much as you folks who have been involved with it for a while, but my question is related to the, the idea of methodology and whether methodology needs a sharper definition. And it's a little bit related to the last set of comments where the, the responders to the RFP should provide us the the, I'll say the list of attributes, the list of factors that they consider important in life cycle analysis. Um, and, and for me also, the types of data sources that they would use to fill in beyond emission, beyond emission data, but those other sources that help describe the life cycle piece. Um, as I say, I, I read through a couple times and it just, I think the methodology is actually way more important than the analysis because, as we've talked about, with the methodology, state staff can carry out the analysis over uh, carry out the analysis. So I didn't know if if there needs to be or this might take place when we review the proposals themselves, um, some sharper definition about what methodology actually represents. Thanks, Ken. I think that that's a really good point and that one of the things that we're going to need to make sure happens in the deliverable <clears throat> is a very high thorough degree of transparency in terms of any and all assumptions that went into the, the methodology and the, the attributes, factors, data sources. So um, I guess I would just say that hearing you say that, um, I, I, I agree with the direction you're going and it may be worth putting up finer point on that, um, certainly something we should pay attention to as a task group and subcommittee as we work with those contractors as well. I believe that's intended, but I, th I think you're right that it may be worth putting a finer point on. Yeah, and I, I think that 
you know, we we specifically highlight that the math, the methodology proposal to be what we will have an opportunity to review and refine with the contractor. So I think that would be that juncture in the contract process or in the, the project itself would be an opportunity to have a really robust discussion about what what that should look like and what it will look like. Um, so I think that is the intent for sure. Great. Ken, if there is anything specific that you know, feel free to put it in the chat or or, or share it. But um. yeah, I, I sent around some comments this morning actually, and um, I. I, I yeah, there there are a couple of them in there, but I could put a I may put a little more effort in just apart from my own my own thinking. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. I, I did see your comments, Ken. I, I didn't have a chance to open them up yet, but um happy to to discuss further. Um Steve. Hi, thanks. Um I gotta uh well first of all, greetings everybody. It's been a while. Uh, after uh, it's it seemed like months of uh, weekly check-ins, it's been a while. Uh, I have a few suggestions here to to think about uh, with regard to this. Uh, first of all, it seems like it might be helpful uh, to pull some of the language out of uh, out of the law, specifically section 582G in chapter 10 that talks about. Uh, uh, accounting protocols that, it, that achieve transparent and accurate life cycle accounting greenhouse gas emissions, including emissions of such gases from use of fossil fuels or renewable fuels such as biomass. Uh, and on adoption, such protocols shall be official protocols to be used by any agency or political subdivision of the state in accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. So it seems, uh, seems like that context is valuable. Uh, and, and other pieces of, of you know, Section 580, uh, 578 and 582 that sort of define what's needed for greenhouse gas emission knowledge. Uh, it seems like it would be useful to have in here uh, in, the, in the RFP. Uh, uh, another, another related, another piece of the law that might be useful to reference, and I know it's actually not law yet, but the, the uh, clean heat standard um, uh, hopefully will be, you know, the implementation of the Clean Heat Center will be able to utilize this work that's being done now and not, you know, have to replicate too much. Um, there's a, one piece in particular in, in the Clean Heat Standard Bill, at Section 8125A8, that talks about double counting and, and uh, uh, sector attribution. It's worth looking at that language, I think, uh, and and provide that, uh, you know, sort of ask that question of the contractors, you know, how would they uh, approach that uh, challenge and uh, where in particular in some areas of greenhouse gas accounting where uh, sector attribution becomes uh, a ch something of a challenge. Um, uh, you uh, were talking earlier about uh, further defining the request on hydroelectric power, you know, large reservoirs, small reservoirs. There are so many of those variables that fit in with something like hydropower. I think those are really good questions to be asking. You know, there is size and that's a factor, but but so is, uh, for example, shape of the basin. You know, the very the the uh, the steeper, uh, narrower. Uh, reservoir basins uh, have much lower greenhouse gas impact than the wider, flatter ones that flood a lot of land. Uh, and then uh, it varies by uh, ecosystem type as well. You know, what kind of ecosystem is being flooded? Was the landscape cleared fully before the reservoir was impounded? Um, that makes a huge difference, not just for greenhouse gas, but for things like mercury pollution as well. Uh, and then the other thing is management regime. Uh, uh, the more a reservoir is raised and lowered, apparently the more methane is emitted. Uh, so I think that's that's all. And I don't I don't 
think you need to define all of those details, but you know, what are the details that are for? What are the management variables? Um, it seems to me it would be smart policy to define those management variables uh, to uh, encourage, incentivize good management because some of these things can vary a lot. Uh, biofuels is another example where, uh, you know, we, it's not a one size fits all uh, question. There are lots of, I'm sure, and I know little about it, but I'm sure that there are lots of uh, approaches to uh, managing, creating biofuels, um, whether it's the agricultural side or the processing side that, and transportation and storage and, and uh, the, the lost methane, the fugitive methane from storage facilities, all these things vary a lot among source. And it seems like it would be really smart not to ignore those variables because by incorporating them, you incentivize good management and you push people to use the best possible practices, which it seems like something it seems like something we ought to be doing. And and the converse of that is that if you don't incentivize good management, you're actually incentivizing bad management because it's cheaper. So uh, it seems to me that diving down into those details would be really helpful. Um, I would add to this point that, you know, similar to what George was saying earlier, uh, define uh, uh, the level of detail that a contractor goes into is going to have a big impact on their expenses and their costs. So it seems like defining this would be useful. Um, the, the last point I want to make separately is on uh, on the question of traditional knowledge. I really appreciate the the, the uh, Dr. Dapini Giroux's suggestion of incorporating, you know, getting uh, uh, indigenous voices on this question because I don't think we most of us can ask the question in a good way. But I just share an observation based on my own experience, which is I, I grew up in a science world um, and, and uh, you know, very immersed in, in the, the, uh, the language of science and the thinking of science. And I was a science teacher for many years. But one aspect of my teaching is, is I taught at Winooski High School, which, as you probably know, is one of the most diverse um, populations in the state. And, and it happens to include people from other parts of the world, a lot of indigenous voices uh, from many parts of the world in my classroom. And one of the lessons that I learned was that my own mindset was very narrow. And, and to really understand where my students, where all these people were coming from, and to understand these other voices, I really had to let go of many of my preconceptions about you know what what the boundaries are of how we think about these things and uh you know i i kind of learned i figured out over time that the scientific mindset is pretty narrow and and so uh i think uh, you know mainly i guess my point is that to do this i think one has to be really ready to recognize one's own biases and be ready to you know challenge that and listen carefully and be ready to think about how to how to shift that kind of bias. So uh, that's it. And uh, thank you. Thank you for all your work on this and uh, good luck. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'll, I'll just respond really briefly to um, your first comment regarding the context for the RFP. Um, we were really careful to um, explain that the context for this RFP is based on the recommendation in the initial climate action plan that this work um, be completed given the reference to um, uh, energy use. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to get the language wrong and I want to be precise about it, so I'm just going to scroll back up, but um, the use of energy in Vermont um, as, as is stated in Section 578 of Title 10. Um, and so, and that is the, the statute that was referenced specifically in the initial climate action plan as well as in terms of citing the need for this work. 
Um, and I think I've shared with this subcommittee before almost a year ago now, you know, my interpretation of the context of um, 582G and the requirements of 582G and the intent behind that. And I this this exercise in this project, um, at least it's my understanding, and I certainly invite Julie and Jane to weigh in as well, is not within the context of 582G. Um, it's to serve a, a different purpose. Um, so, and that's not saying that some of the language in 582G doesn't speak to this, but that's my interpretation. Um, and in terms of your comment on the on the clean heat standard and the life cycle analysis that is proposed in that bill, um, you know that's come up several times in in various conversations and and committees, and I think um, that you know, this analysis hopefully will have some, if not a lot of utility in that discussion um, and that we can find efficiencies in using this work to inform um, the development of the, the work that the technical advisory group um, for the clean heat standard uh, may or may not have the opportunity to do. Um, so I think that's that's a good point. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I know you made two other points and I, I See, Jared, you have your hand up, so I don't know if you want to respond to some of Steve's other comments. Well, yeah, on that second point around the role of life cycle analysis in a supplemental inventory versus the role of life cycle analysis in, um, you know, accordance with the clean heat standard if it becomes signed into law, <clears throat> I would just note that. I agree with what you said, Megan, that hopefully this effort would be helpful to the, the technical analysis group that would be formed for the life cycle analysis, you know, related to the clean heat standard and the, the PUC and PSD and ANR and others would be involved with that. But I think that there's also, it's, it's, the, it's the other direction as well. And that like going back to the comment you were making, Richard, that the first year will be the hardest. Um, then we may be able to kind of use some of those that that data and methodology that gets collected in subsequent years. But I think a, a number of those factors, you know, will will have a higher degree of resolution o over time, especially because of um, the work of the technical analysis group related to the clean heat standard. And, and the distinction I would make here, I think they're related, but I think they're different topics. I think for an inventory. There's a higher level summary and average of emissions that you know it's it's difficult to get to a really fine degree of resolution for a statewide inventory, which is different than how we would assess with a much finer degree of resolution the life cycle emissions of specific fuels participating in a performance standard program specific to a sector. So I fully expect this is just me at this point. But from having been involved in both of these conversations, that there's going to be a much finer degree of resolution, much more uh, specific um, data <clears throat> that relates to the life cycle emissions uh, as applied to different uh, clean heat sources and fossil sources to do that comprehensive life cycle analysis for all of the obligated parties in the heat standard then there would be for a statewide emissions inventory that by virtue of the level of elevation it's at is going to have to my expectation is seeing other inventories you know knowing the vermont approach knowing what other states and provinces have done is going to likely have to um you know just be at a higher level of, of utilizing some averages um than the, the much more refined techniques that will likely be necessary for the clean heat standard and eventually possibly the renewable energy standard if that moves in a direction of, of measuring emissions reduction and not just renewability as was at least contemplated in the climate action plan recommendations. Um, I, I, if I could if I could respond just a little bit to that. Uh, you do want to use this to to monitor improvements. Yes. And and there's and, and uh, you know it seems that improvements in greenhouse gas emissions could come from some of those finer tuned pieces. Uh, so the you know cross referencing I I can see what you're saying about uh, more detail later, but but uh, at at the same time there 
they'll have to talk to each other. Agreed. So thanks, Steve. I'm not seeing anybody else's hand up at the moment. We're a little behind on the agenda. What I would suggest, it sounds like there were some, some um, largely we're in a really good place with this. There were a few minor suggestions made here. I think Ken sent some suggestions. Um, my suggestion would be, and would look to you, Megan, um, uh, but just to like kind of get a, not really a motion on the floor because that's not the way we work, but um, just to try to get some clarity on next steps would be to work to incorporate those if, if mainly what Ken's suggestions are, are, you know, added clarity and transparency around methodology sounded like there was good support and consensus for that. And it's, I don't anticipate that anything Ken suggested would have been a, you know, taking out of or a, a major change to the um, RFP. It, if that was the case, it might be good to discuss those, but otherwise I would, I would be comfortable with um, asking, I, I think, especially just because of the knowledge of the time frame we're on and wanting to be able to, um, Get this out on a on a tight time frame. I'm I'm feeling good about the quality of kind of where it stands, the improvements made made, made today, and the kind of general direction that um, you've proposed, Megan. Curious if others have thoughts on that. So just to clarify, um, the the pro the proposal is for the subcommittee to essentially you know defer to. Um, you know, state staff that have been working on incorporating comments and feedback, and then also to reconsider the addition of task three and the implementation phase um, in light of the budget that we're that we're working with. Um, and then to move forward with release of the RFP following that kind of like, you know, closing the loop on all of those pieces of feedback. Yeah, and I, and I would suggest that as soon as there is a next draft ready, if that can be shared with the task group in case there is anything right away. But I, I wouldn't want to say, I, I guess I just get worried about having to schedule another task group meeting or subcommittee meeting and, and, and delaying that um, release of it even further. But I okay. think as soon as a draft is ready, it would be good to have it circulated so that individual comments could be shared with you at least by email. Okay. Sounds good. <clears throat> and any objections to that approach? Seems right. reasonable. Great. Well, thanks for everyone. Thanks everyone for taking a look and for your feedback. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to um, reporting back on hopefully some great proposals. Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm seeing a note from Jane about outreach to, um, oh, because the representative from Ag and Ecosystems wasn't able to join our task group meeting. So, um, hopefully that can be shared with that person. And, Absolutely. Yeah. When when it goes back to the task group, Jane, that will include Ryan, who's the rep from Agadigo, correct? And Judy, who's also from Agadigo. Yeah, it was more a question about process for how that subcommittee wants okay. to engage, just knowing that decision points are really supposed to be with the subcommittee and there, that subcommittee hasn't met um, in a long time. And I don't, I'm not sure if they intend to, but I did reach out to the co-chairs just to We'll have them bless like the task group approving it moving forward without a subcommittee meeting, but haven't heard anything and no one co chairs on vacation this week. Okay. Yeah. Well, you you are our conduit to the outside world of bidders. So you <laughs> you uh um that you know we can we can certainly facilitate that with your help. Anything else on that, Jane or Megan? Oh, I think we're ready to move on to um, uh, nominations, review of nominations. So as a contextual resource, I'm putting in the chat, um, which you can also uh, access at the um, uh, climate change 
www.vermont.gov website for the meeting. Um, if you go to the about section, it has the document listing the subcommittee composition. Um, right now, we have nine listed members of the subcommittee. Megan and myself as co-chairs, council members, um, Secretary Moore, um, Brian Gray, Dr. Uh, Dupini Giroux, and then additional members, uh, Kashka Orlo, um, uh, Dr. Jay Schaefer, Richard Hopkins, and, and Claire. I will note that I had a conversation with uh, Councillor Brian Gray, who has been a member of the subcommittee. He had to step um, back. Um, uh, he's continued to participate actively in the council as a whole, but um, wasn't able to as much on this subcommittee. And, and he had expressed a desire to kind of stay focused as a counselor uh, in the full council, but but um, uh, but um, suggested that it may make sense for him to step down, likely makes sense for him to step down as a subcommittee member here. So that would bring our subcommittee to, to eight members. The Can context is- Comment on that just real quick. Yeah. I just wanna say that's unique. Um, we don't have any legislative appointments who don't serve on a subcommittee. So we'll just just want to identify that as different <laughs> and for other counselors. So I'll, I didn't know that and um, I will probably reach out and we as a steering committee should probably just identify if that's OK at this point. So maybe we'll just leave it as a question until we can follow Brian to have those conversations and you know maybe if it was that that was problematic he he you know would we reconsider that I think his the assumption was that it wouldn't be problematic but um because I don't think that there's anything in the GWSA law that requires a counselor to serve on a subcommittee it just seems like it's been the practice um okay um so we we had a very long open nomination process uh, as a council. There were also uh, nominations made for other subcommittee members that were looking to um, add new members. Um, I think the number that I think we ended up receiving something like 17 nominations, a real breadth, diversity, quality of nominations. We agreed at our subcommittee meeting um, last month that we would form a small review committee um, to look at them, uh, all those nominations to consider them against the criteria that we've discussed as a subcommittee, which I'll, I'll mention briefly. Um, and we did that. We actually had two different meetings of that kind of nominations review subgroup. It was uh, uh, included Megan and myself as co-chairs. It also included um, Leslie Ann and Claire. Um, and, you know, I will say that because of the breadth and diversity and quality of the nominations that come in, came in, you know, individual members of that group um, certainly put forward a whole variety of, of names, including ones that didn't kind of the final suggested slate that was in the meeting attachments and that we'll discuss now. But we did see real value in agreeing um, on a consensus slate that all four of us felt very comfortable um, putting forward as our as the recommended additions to the subcommittee for for your consideration today um, <clears throat> i will note um, that some of those listed criteria in terms of expertise experience including lived experience um, included um, um, uh, economics life cycle analysis uh, youth representation uh, resilience, health data analysis, uh, energy equity focus, and of course we went back to the original criteria that have always been with us when we look at subcommittees, which includes uh, diversity around uh, just representation of, of different lived experiences in Vermont from geography um, to, to race to economic situation, etc. cetera. Um, uh, with all of that said, we um, want to put forward for uh, your consideration and um, hope for approval, um, a list of seven um, members, new new proposed members that would bring the full subcommittee to um, 15, which is about the same as cross-sector, less than the approved slate that was just 
uh, put forward um, and approved actually by the steering committee on Monday for the just transition subcommittee. Um, and maybe I'll just run through those names and, and say a little bit about some of the, I mean, a, a number of these folks that we'll recommend had um, uh, addressed multiple of the desired kind of um, qualifications or, or criteria or attributes that we were looking for. Um, uh, but um, Dr. Tara Kulkarni, who's a professor at Norwich University, um, who runs, uh, he, who's very involved, uh, actually some of you may know she's helping lead the Resilient Vermont Conference, which is uh, next Friday and leads the Center for Global Resilience there and does a lot of resilience related um, research um, uh, and would, would be a huge help on the um, resilience metrics and is just kind of broadly, uh, incredibly knowledgeable. Um, also nice to have an, an addition of a different educa higher education institution, um, you know, Norwich in Northfield adds some geographic diversity and, and Tara is also a, a woman of color. Um, uh, we consensus recommendation around Ken Jones, um, the economic research analyst at the Agency of Commerce, um, who does uh, great and really important work on um, economic analysis and, and research and, and reports. Um, Ken has already been really helpful as a kind of uh, staff um, uh, who's reviewed a lot of the economic analysis, but it would be great to have him as a full subcommittee member. Um, um, I will actually, I'm, re I'm just cog cognizant that I'm speaking quite a bit. So I'm just, maybe I will run through um, the remainder of the names and invite other uh, of the kind of uh, nominations group to say something briefly about those folks. There is also the information that they submitted either as self nominations or the other people nominated them for, but um, Kevin Geiger from Two Rivers out of Kuichi Regional Commission, um, Una Darrell, who's a um, senior at Middlebury College, Jared Ulmer from the Department of Health, Elizabeth Palchak, formerly with BEIC, now the Sustainability uh, Coordinator or Director at University of Vermont, and Catherine Lothar, who is a, uh, affiliated with, with Goddard College. So maybe I'll ask um, if other members of that group want to say anything about those nominees. But that is that is our recommended slate of names, as you can see in the um, in the attached document, which I will also link to. In, uh, I'll put that link in the chat in case folks weren't able to access it on the website. Megan, Claire, or Leslie Ann, is there anything you want to add about um, any of those individuals? Um, I guess I'll just say that um, you know we we had a, a really impressive list of nominees, um, and it was it definitely took us several rounds of discussion. Um, to put this list together, but I think it it um, represents a great um, uh, you know um, group of, of additions to um, to the subcommittee and some great you know diverse perspectives and backgrounds um, that will really um, you know make I think our discussions a lot more well not that they haven't been already but I think it will make for some really um, robust and thoughtful discussions um, with a lot of really great perspectives so I'm looking forward to new membership yeah and I would I guess just echo that I um, felt like each sort of candidate was bringing a skill set that we had tried to identify, for example, Kevin Geiger um, was bringing sort of geospatial analysis, which would be really valuable. Also would bring a, a regional planning commission perspective to the subcommittee. Um, Jared Ulmer, we've talked about quite a number of times in terms of being able to lend the house perspective um, as a full subcommittee member. Um, Elizabeth Palchak would bring, you know, sort of expertise both in the human dimensions and also um, is involved in energy equity related work. Um, and then with Una Darrell, both a youth perspective and then adding an additional um, 
higher education sort of affiliation through Middlebury. So we also talked about sort of that nice being balanced between having so many different um, academic institutions represented. So um, yeah, if there's anything else to add there, but. No, I think I think we we got all of the the various pieces, and the only additional piece would be Catherine brings the the Goddard College dimension. So really, really nice fleshing out of academic institutions across the entire state. So we get both the um, the geographic breadth, but also the academic breadth, which is great. Great. I see hands from um, Julie and Jane. I think that was the order as well. Julie, if you want to go ahead. I, my question was just about sort of geographic distribution and know that we're sorely lacking from a, the southern third ish of the state. And I didn't know if you'd received any nominations um, from from folks sort of below uh, Route 4. I, I do think that part I would have to double check my geography, but I do believe that part of the two rivers out of Quichi Regional Commission extends below Route 4, but I, it, where Kev, Kevin Gar, Geiger represents. Um, it, it does indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but I, and but, Megan, I think extends below Route, <laughs> Route 4 as co-chair of our subcommittee, perhaps. I just, I worry that we end up with a very heavy um, weight towards Northwest Vermont. Um, and in particular, that there's some sort of unique aspects and attributes to that, that I think um, we would benefit from a broader geographic perspective. That that said, I understand we're in some ways playing the hand we're dealt um, in the nominations received. And so if we didn't receive nominations from from sort of the southern third of the state, I, that's what it is. It may be something we can just go after with intention uh, the next time we need to look to add committee members. That was, that was definitely something we talked about, Julie, when reviewing the list. And I, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head that we we were dealing with um, or playing the hand we were dealt. And um, unfortunately, we, we were we did kind of scan the list several times to see if we could figure out a better geographic distribution, but it just wasn't possible with the list that we had. Understood. And considering the other criteria as well, I, I've kind of always thought of the ge geographic diversity piece is something that we want to achieve, but not at the expense of the kind of core criteria of the other relevant qualifications and experience. It, it was also nice. I mean, I think that even though, I mean, I think actually of that group of seven, there's only one that's Chittenden County, many more kind of in the broad central Vermont, whether that's Washington, Orange, I think the first, well, I guess it would be a second subcommittee member from Addison County. With with Una, in addition, who is also a woman of color, uh, in addition to, to Richard, who's already in Addison County. So I think that I, I hear the point and agree with it very much about um, you know being unfortunate that, that there's there's not more representation of say Wyndham and <clears throat> Bennington counties here, but I think among the rest of the counties there is a fairly good um, diversity of representation. So Jane. I wanted to speak to um, a couple things, but first I wanted to mention that both David Grass and um, Jared Ulmer, and for folks don't, who don't know, they both work at the Department of Public of Health and David supervises Jared, have been like starting to staff rural resilience um, and adaptation subcommittee. Um, and I think that it would be nice if we could split them up, um, have one staffing each subcommittee, knowing that their relevant expertise is germane to both. I actually think based on just my limited understanding of their expertise that Jared might be better for rural resilience and David might be better for this subcommittee. That said, I think that we should just speak with them both and ask them about capacity and which subcommittee they'd like to staff serve on um, and give them the chance to make the selection, but just want to be mindful that they are um, serving on rural, going to rural resilience right now. So just want to make sure that we're not like pulling there. So, Leslie. Yeah, so 
Thank you for raising that, Jane. I actually had that deep dive conversation with Jared. Um, we went back and forth for three days and he chatted with David Grass um, and they decided which one was going to do what and Jared actually self-nominated. Okay, he self-nominated yeah. for rural resilience also though, which I don't, so still. Yeah, so, so this, this was, I think, more recent because he had already talked about the fact that yes, he had been sort of tapped for, for rural resilience and so question that he had for me was how did this kind of play out and, and what were the rules and responsibilities of a person staffing a committee relative to being a full subcommittee member and so I think that was where it landed after all of these discussions and he said totally if they needed to sort that. of just in talking to Catherine and Erica they wanted to offer him a like that subcommittee just operates very differently um, than all the other subcommittees, I'll just say. And they have they have this very open subcommittee where they're like, well, we don't care if you're a subcommittee member. We treat the public and staff all as equals, which is how they've worked and operated for the last year and a half. Um, and they never have public comment. They just have public comment throughout the whole meeting. And when we brought up this issue of like, well, full subcommittee nomination versus a staffing, um, they were prepared to offer Jared if that was somehow more better for him. So I, I, I totally appreciate that you're prob that he's probably already decided, just wanted to put it out there and still yeah, clarify that. Absolutely. And having worked with Jared, and I have to keep, we'll have to stay, say names if we have two Jareds on, on the subcommittee. So <laughs> having worked with both Jared Ulma and David Grass for over a decade, I know they work really, really closely. It's just like back and forth. And so one can sub in for the other. And I think they've sort of had that discussion to sort of come to terms with what would work best for the Department of Health, but also bringing that, that set of expertise to wherever it is they happen to land, so. Perfect. And can you just, um, the other question I had for Jared and Megan or whoever else on the committee that reviewed this, I'm, I'm sorry I missed it perhaps, but what will this bring your total number to of subcommittee members? I think, I think it depends on Brian. If if we assume that um, Brian would not continue, um, it would bring it to 15 total. If we if Brian did, it would be 16 total. Um, okay. Again, yeah. I, I, obviously, we just set precedents yesterday um, or on Monday this week, approving just transitions to have 16 members. Um, but I just move with caution around consideration of having that many members, what it means for quorum. If all the subcommittees have that many members and budgeting for per diems, I, I, it, just different than what we had planned for. Again, I, I think we have plenty of room to pay and do all of that. So I'm not, that's sort of like a minor component, <laughs> but just, um, and I think I have felt and continue to feel in this like time of implementation and work sharing, it's great to have more people to carry that weight. Um, where reaching consensus is not as critical as it was in the plan and trying to pull that many people together, but it still just makes things a bit more challenging. Two of our nominees are state staff, so you won't have to pay them per diem. <laughs> yes. Phew. Same and we did, I mean, Jared said this, but we did talk about that a lot and factored it in versus bringing more diverse expertise versus the number and, and all those things. And it wasn't made lightly, the number. Leslie Ann, is that an old hand or a new hand? Old hand, disappearing now. Okay. Great. Any other um, comments or questions from subcommittee members or staff? So hearing none right away but please interrupt if, if you do have it um <clears throat> i think the process from here would be if we have agreement as a subcommittee to accept this uh, group of nominations the next step would be for kind of final formal approval by the steering committee which just had a meeting so it won't meet again for i think like a month i don't know the ex i don't have the exact date in front of me um so would ask um if if anyone has any concerns about this group going forward for that 
kind of final sub steering committee piece. I will note that the steering committee, while there are sometimes questions and discussions on this to date, there's always been a deference to, and um, it ends up being mostly a formality um, in terms of the approval process. So that would be one question. And if that is the case, I would want to think so we don't lose another month of having these new folks join just go ahead. I mean, it's a public meeting anyway, but go ahead and ask them to join um, the next subcommittee meeting so we can begin introductions, even if there still will be that outstanding final piece from the steering committee. Um, I do see hands from Richard and then Jane. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to the group that did this work. It's a fine slate. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, and I'll just say that um, I think that it would be nice to actually to proceed cautiously, assuming that the steering committee will approve only because in addition to sort of not missing a beat, um, Marion has done an excellent job of putting together a subcommittee um, onboarding, <laughs> that's the word I'm looking for, document as well as two trainings that her and I are going to do to orient new subcommittee members to um, ongoing work, to the processes and guidance that you need to have as a public member, email, all that kind of stuff, and those dates are upcoming. So we'll work with you closely to get all those emails and to welcome them, like contingent on steering ap committee approval, but assuming they're okay with investing some time ahead of that formality, um, we can work to engage with them around um, the trainings and processes now. Great, thanks, Jane. <clears throat> Hey, so that that seems like a good path forward unless anyone has any concerns or questions that they want to raise before we go to the next agenda item of other updates, which I'm sorry, we have a little bit less time than we planned for. Okay, so not hearing anything. Um, any um, work group liaison updates or uh, liaisons with other subcommittee updates. Uh, I'll, I'll offer one very quickly because it relates to the conversation that we just had. There is a cross-sector mitigation subcommittee meeting tomorrow. Um, actually, one of the nominees to the science and data subcommittee, I think there were actually three nominations of this person given their experience and expertise related to life cycle analysis and related to biomass questions was Adam Sherman. Um, from Vermont, from the EIC, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Um, there, it became clear as we were doing that review um, that um, somebody who had been really active, um, Ed McNamara, um, in the biomass task group conversation from the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee was going to be stepping off of that subcommittee. And so there was going to be a gap in terms of that, um, somebody participating in that group from that subcommittee. And so there was a recommendation that was made to the cross-sector co-chairs to, to cons that, that, or that there was a conversation about us not adding Adam because there may be an opportunity to have him join uh, cross-sector so that cross-sector can continue to have uh, a, an active participant with experience and expertise on life cycle emissions and the bi biomass side um, over there. So just wanted to note that that, you know, he was nominated multiple times that that question came up and, and I think he will be considered by that subcommittee as a potential addition given Ed's departure. Um, and, but otherwise. Peter, just sorry, Jared. Peter's oh, departure. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't mean Ed to. departed earlier. <laughs> but were they both, oh, weren't they both at one point participating in the, no, I'm sorry. No, I don't, I I don't think Ed ever was, but right. it's okay. There's been a lot of folks moving around lately. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. The, the other thing I would say is that there will be an update tomorrow from the transportation task group at Cross Sector. Um, there will be a um, the next webinar as we assess different transportation policy options, working backward from our November deadline to make a recommendation as a council um, about transportation strategies. There will be a webinar next Friday, uh, May 13th. Um, related to cap and invest policies that I believe 
either has been or will be sent out soon to the full council list um, by someone. Maybe that's Jane. Is that, thank you, Jane. <laughs> so I think those are the two most relevant updates from Cross Sector. If there's others, please go ahead from other subcommittees or task groups. Well, Richard and Megan, the biomass task group met this morning, so. Yeah, um, thanks, Jane. We, and I'm happy to give a, a brief update. Um, we did meet this morning and um, we had a, a great um, presentation. Um, I believe this is gonna be the first of, of several guest speakers that we have um, within that task group. I think the aim of that is to better inform um, the uh, um, kind of scope and, and direction of the the work and the questions that the, the subgroup is trying to answer. But this morning we heard from um, Thomas Buckholtz and um, it, you know, it, those are public, um, uh, publicly accessible meetings. And so encourage folks to tune into that discussion as we have more guest speakers um, to have um, good discussions with the group. I think we're looking at asking Ali Kasiba, and I can't remember the name of the other individual, Jane, to join us for a, our one of our next meetings. Bill Keaton. Bill Keaton, thank you. I'll, I'm gonna drop in the chat the link to the video and in case, and I'm going to I haven't posted the slides yet, but I'll do that right now while you're talking and the scope, the scope for the biomass task group is also posted. Um, just just Kashka is not here. Um, just transitions did meet two weeks ago. I unfortunately couldn't attend and haven't watched the video yet, so I can't provide an update in her absence, but they believe they're also meeting again next week. Um, so I don't know, Jane, if there's any relevant updates from that. We had a a really great um, meeting, um, actually, that Marion helped facilitate a Jamboard session that was really productive around um, thinking about application of the guiding principles and relevancy to how Just Transitions engages with task groups. Um, really great um, outcomes and deliverables. And one of the um, components was to ensure, especially on substantive components of the work, representation from Just Transitions members to ensure that it's a front and center thought about the application of the guiding principles, not an afterthought as um, actions or recommendations are being considered. So. Um, Chris Campany serves that role on um, the transportation task group, and um, I, we need to nominate someone for the biomass task group because what I'm appreciating is that we're sort of asking a lot of our ag and eco representation to think about both the impacts on the, our cult, on the landscape and ecosystems, but also on the just transitions and equity components of the work. So be thinking about the right person in that space. Um, and assuming no questions while I have the floor, I, I just thought briefly, I haven't even had the chance to update anyone internally really on the measuring and assessing progress tool, but I know that this is a really um, key sort of ongoing task that science and data will help um, have input on. And you may all remember that this task group hasn't met since the adoption of the climate action plan that the task group, which was all science and data subcommittee members leading up to the adoption of the plan, um, laid out a framework for um, the development of the measuring and assessing progress tool that that framework was used pretty much primarily to develop an RFP. That RFP has sort of been not not sort of been has been stalled <laughs> with um, ADS consideration, the Agency of Digital Services. We finally, after two months, met yesterday <laughs> with our general counsel and ADS to really think about how we are going to advance um, that um, RFP. And there's a strong recommendation from both our general counsel and from um, IT that as we moved forward and put together a proposal that envisioned phase one, the planning of the database and phase two, the building of it, um, they would like to pull phase two out um, and think about that just phase one and then think about a, con a new RFP a year from now when we're ready to build it. 
that sort of different and I'm I'm saying that mostly because um, you may or may not remember we had Cadmus had this as a task within their contract and we decided not to continue to work with them because we'd rather have one vendor who could do it all for us and be thinking about that um, and now we're getting advised to pull it apart so I just learned that yesterday um, and I'll be thinking about what that looks like and how to revise it based on input from others in ANR. And then also thinking we had a great meeting um, internally at ANR to really be thinking about how that tracking tool speaks to the inventory, but how the inventory speaks to the tracking tool and how those two are really coordinated thoughtfully even further than they are right now in the RFP. So we're going to look at that one more time and then also Claire did an excellent job of facilitating a conversation with Just Transitions folks about metrics for equity. And while that is thought about in the RFP, it could be thought about more intentionally. And so there's also a need to look at that RFP from that component also. So there's next steps, but it was it felt like a major roadblock to get something back from ADS after two months yesterday. <laughs> I'm wondering, I know this is all um, kind of in process, so there may not be an answer yet, but I'm thinking in relation to the conversation we had earlier about the interface between the life cycle analysis we'll do as a supplement to the inventory with the possible passage and implementation of the clean heat standard. I'm, I'm wondering to what degree, picking up on the topic of metrics for equity, the possible passage and implementation of the environmental justice bill would relate to um, how those metrics kind of are tracked in the measuring and assessing progress tool versus what is anticipated in the EJ bill. Yeah, I can't really speak to that that well. Julie just came off mute though. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I might be able to just offer. I I think there's sort of a, a fairly long runway in front of the the EJ will EJ bill in terms of the work that needs to be done to st establish a statewide environmental policy, and I don't think it will be uh, congruent with the timeline that many of the tasks we're discussing here today are on. I I think there's up to two years provided with the first step being a mapping tool. Um, and that may be a place of greater intersection where we'll want to understand some of the, the data considerations that will be brought into that environmental justice screening and mapping tool and, and whether those those have a logical nexus with some of our work. Thanks, Julie. Um, it sounded like from what you said earlier, Jane, that Ag and Ecosystems has not met, so there's probably not an much of an update there. Was there any, I wonder if Jay or anybody else has, or Jane, anything that the rest of the subcommittee should be aware of from rural resilience? Marion's here. She could give an update. For that. Sure. Hi, everyone. Sorry for joining late. Um, was that jury duty? That was fun. Um, so rural resilience uh, is not meeting. They were intending to meet this week and decided to cancel their meeting due to what would likely have been a light agenda. Um, they, I think, as you all know, are focused on two primary task groups, the Municipal Vulnerability Index, um, which Jane might have some updates on or have already shared, and then the Climate Toolkit, which has some members from this subcommittee as well. Um, they are also considering new membership. I think you all have talked about that a bit. Um, and so we're hoping to invite four new members to join the subcommittee um, and are on the same timeline as you all. Um, I can speak a little bit to the toolkit so that the toolkit group, uh, which has folks from uh, mostly Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee, um, Virginia Diembo from Just Transition Subcommittee, and then Leslie Ann from Science and Data, um, have been meeting bi-weekly and are um, in the process of um, analyzing some stakeholder engagement that uh, they've done with potential end users of the toolkit, looking at resources that should be included in the toolkit, and thinking about technical assistance providers that the toolkit should connect to. Um, so I think we're in a really good place to think about um, the uses of the toolkit and the design of it, looking at some next steps and exploring some options with actually connecting with some um, NOAA or data that um, Leslie Yen uses within the, um, the climate office that she manages. Um, so exploring some options there, but looking like we have some good next steps on building that out further. And then Jane, I don't know if you updated already on the Municipal Vulnerability Index, but can, that's the other component of the subcommittee's work. Um, that's also a cross-cutting task group of which um, 
Leslie Ann and uh, from sits on from your subcommittee, also just transitions um, members and rural resilience and adaptation subcommittee members. We've had a draft RFP that's been working its way through ADS review and leadership review here at our agency. And um, I have some comments still to work through and consider, but um, as we address those later this week, I'm ho hoping we're close to posting that in the coming days. Of which the next step will be for that task group to come back together to convene and review proposals. Richard, is, is your hand current or is that an, an older hand? Or a previous hand, I should say. Um, one other question on the measuring and assessing progress tool, just to go back to that for a second, Jane, is do you have an, a sense of a likely timeline or time frame for when that task group would be pulled together again to review a revised RFP and talk about next step? Or is it unclear yet based on the conversation with ADS? Um, the hope would be that it would be posted. I think in all reality, um, it'll be posted no sooner than a month from now. Because um, it's not and so much of a content change from what we described. It's more of the splitting of the phase one and phase two. But the, yes, I, yeah, okay. it's a splitting from ADS's perspective. It's a splitting. I do think mm -hmm. that as far as a review and consideration of um, there were some questions um, about the logic model. Mm -hmm. um, and where and what we land on if there are any substantive changes um i will pull the task group back together to discuss um if it's largely just a separation of phase one and phase two um then we'll proceed and pull together once it's posted great okay any other updates from subcommittees or task groups please speak now I, in case you don't know, since Ag and Eco weren't in here, um, Leslie Ann, sorry, I didn't. I heard you. I see you come off camera, and I realized it was your voice. <laughs> Which you should know by now, James. <laughs> yeah. So the only other update is um, my class at, at UVM, Satellite Climatology and Land Surface Processes, has been doing what's called service learning with um, members of of the council. So. Uh, Julie, Jane, and Marion visited at the very beginning of class and laid out some of the pieces that we still had questions about in, in looking at climate resilience zones and looking at um, aspects of carbon sequestration and looking at um, elements of vulnerability. And so the, the class, which is 21 students, worked through the entire semester and they presented yesterday um, with um, Marion was there. I invited all of the co-chairs and um, who else was there? I had a couple of colleagues from NOAA were there and they did an absolute amazing job. Um, I'm looking forward to delving into a lot of the, the very um, interesting moving pieces, including some definitions of vulnerability. So I don't know if Marion wants to speak because I will be a little bit biased. They're my students, they did a great job, but hopefully I can do a summary of some of those um, elements that could, could help lift up some of the things that we're still working on as a council. Yeah, I can just jump in quickly. You should be biased, Leslie, and they did a really great job. Um, so for folks that won't there, the, each group uh, looking at ag emissions, uh, climate vulner or uh, climate resilience zones and vulnerability um, came up with policy proposals, um, which sort of covered the board of some that were included or match closely to items in the climate action plan, but others that didn't. And I think uh, sparked some really interesting questions and discussion for the class and the folks that were um, sitting in as well. So looking forward to those eight pages of notes that you said you had, Leslie, and to share. Um, yeah, it was really cool. Those were grading notes, Marion. <laughs> okay. We'll have a different batch, but yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that was great. And if the one comment I was going to make actually relates to the example that Marianne and Leslie Ann used, which is, I'm not sure if, if anybody shared this yet, and maybe you did, Megan, before I jumped on the meeting, but we were funded with a US Climate Alliance grant. Was, did you already discuss this? You're nodding. I, I did not. I okay. Was <laughs> to agreeing with you that yes, we have, we have received funding. <laughs> to further explore the ag sector in the greenhouse gas inventory. 
um, and to at largely ask the questions that um, were put forward as recommendations from Ag and Eco. And so as we look to develop um, the that proposal and RFP, we'll be looking to engage with the folks who represented the inventory task group on science and data, as well as the folks who volunteered from Ag and Eco. All right, because I'm worried that with the Teams meeting, we're going to get kicked off right at the hour. No, it won't. Okay, well, anyway, we should still move to public comment if there is any. Um, I know we did a session of uh, public comment earlier, but if there's anything additional. Hearing none or while we wait, someone please feel free to raise your hand if it comes to you. I will just say for the last agenda item, our next scheduled meeting is on Wednesday, June 1st from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, Megan and I will meet um, hopefully with Jane ahead of that to work on drafting an agenda. If folks have any thoughts <clears throat> on that agenda, um, please please let us know. Um, but hopefully we'll have a number, a number of new uh, nominees uh, to the subcommittee joining us then and can have some good time for introductions as well as kind of the ongoing updates and work and discussion of the different task groups and subcommittees. One thing that Megan and I um, discussed, I don't know if um, Megan, you were able to check in with Jane about this. So this might be a little bit of a surprise, but um, I think it's a good surprise. It's just a question. It's not a recommendation at this point. Um, I know that the council had brought up we, we were just reflecting on how many members of this subcommittee, at least for us personally, we had not met ever in person and um, hoping that with the warmer weather and hoping things improving on the pandemic side that it might be possible to actually do uh, an in-person subcommittee meeting sometime over the summer, perhaps, you know, in a pavilion, outdoors, you know, open air, something. Anyway, not a firm proposal there, but we wanted to just float that idea and get some initial feedback. It probably wouldn't be for June, but maybe for July or August as an opportunity to actually meet in person, meet each other. I know that there's some like logistical questions around public meeting laws and, and warning that, but I know we've done that in the past. Anyway, just wanted to raise that question to see if either subcommittee members had thoughts on that or if Jane or Mary, you had any thoughts on that. I'd be curious to hear what people think. I think it sounds great. I, people have been reluctant at other levels in this organ, the council organization, but I think it's really nice to come together. And as you have a new subcommittee composition and the next phase of work really diving into, I think that's a really nice time to do it. Is, is the council taking uh, a month off over the summer? taking four months off well then the question becomes Three, right? it is is the subcommittee also taking some time off i think that's to subcommittee discretion uh -huh. <laughs> i think the we we had already talked about scaling back to just once a month my my sense is that there's enough moving forward with different rfps and task groups that likely be good to at least to keep a month meeting on on the books in case that there are relevant kind of updates or decision points or discussions that would be helpful to have but i personally would just say that i'd, I'd you know be good with keeping no more than one a month going forward for the next few months but would be a little bit hesitant to take those monthly meetings away I would just ask as a, a faculty member whose only time off is in the summer um, and who has not had any summer months off for the last two years, if we could have just one month where we don't have any meetings, that would be my plea to you. Do you have a preference, Leslie, and about what month that would be? Uh, probably July. Um, I, I, I think that might be good timing to take a month off for a subcommittee meeting. And I know the, you know, folks at ANR and DEC will be really in the throes of the um, rulemakings for advanced lean cars and advanced lean trucks over the summer as well. Um, so 
think that's going to be another um, demand on time um, that month. I mean, well, it sounds like it's good with that based on those recommendations. I think we can also kind of take it up for a final decision when we meet in June. But um, unless folks just want to say right now, we will, that will be our meeting. And then the next meeting we would schedule would be for August. Are there any concerns with that? I, I, I would actually um, start with the next meeting with that because I think that's what happened when the meeting schedule was set up. I had to pop off to a faculty meeting and I didn't even know that we had set up a, a regular meeting schedule. So I was a little bit surprised. I was like, it popped up on my calendar and I was like, when did that happen? And so we only have three people left on, on the call right now. So I think to the extent that we do it from an equity perspective and start off our June call with asking that would be good. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Happy to bring that up again then at the beginning of that meeting. But I think based on, unless somebody has a concern, happy to plan for now as though there would not be a July meeting based on what you said, Leslie, and you said, Megan. Well, the people who aren't here can't raise an objection, so. Okay. Anything else before we go? Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Great meeting. Thanks. See you June 1st. All right. Bye. Take care.